let me know. I'm Sylvia Munizkaya. I'm the District Conservationist for NRCS out of the Hadley Field Office, and I'm also um, the District Conservationist for Greenfield. We just have a little bit of information this afternoon on programs that we have available to mitigate climate change. So the NRCS, I don't know if you are all familiar with the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in 2022 by President Biden. So it offers um, an additional $19.5 billion over the course of five years that the agency has available within all of our programs to spend. It doesn't create any additional new programs, we just divide it into our existing programs. So if you work with us before, that's you know the environmental quality incentives program or um, the conservation stewardship program. So it is split between all of those. Um, the funding for IRA began in 2023 and it's also available in 2025 up until 2031 when all of the funds have to be expended. So producers play a critical role in you know reducing greenhouse gas emissions sequestering carbon as you all know that's why we're here today to have that open discussion as to what we can do to mitigate climate change so under the ira there is additional funds specifically for climate change mitigation there is a list of mitigation activities that have been identified by the agency different practices that we currently offer that we could fund under IRA um, to help you know help you all mitigate climate change. Um, some examples could be you know tree and shrub establishment, cover crops, crop rotation. There's also waste separation facilities which <coughs> involve waste transfer, um, roofs and covers, irrigation water management. There are certain improvements that can be done to irrigation systems, existing irrigation systems um, as well as energy improvements within the farm you know that could be dairy as well um, there are several practices in addition to um, no-till equipment so reduced till no-till that we can also explore so we all play a big part in trying to address what we're currently facing especially if we've noticed the changes these past three years in the valley Mm -hmm. um, so we're just here available for you guys if you need any type of assistance, you know, in the topics that we're going to be discussing here today. Um, we have funds available, we have practices available that can help you mitigate what you're trying to achieve within the farm. Just so don't hesitate to reach out. We're going to be here for the course of the discussion today. Um, if you don't get the opportunity to talk to either Soraya or Lillian or myself, um, I'm in the Hadley Field Office, so we'll provide our contact information. There's also a sign-up sheet that you can provide your information and we will contact you and also send additional information your way. So we're just here available for you guys. Thank you. Do you have an engineer now to catch up on the irrigation <laughs> design? <laughs> There was money available for your irrigation systems, but there was no engineer to design. Um, he was, if you're referencing the last couple months, Manuel was on maternity, I mean, paternity leave, but he's back on staff, and yes, we're also exploring different options with um, AFT. We have implementation specialists that we're trying to explore the option of getting them up to speed and how to design those small irrigation systems so that they can help us with you know the capacity that Manuel has to provide those engineering designs so if we bring them on board up to speed they might be able to just assist us in getting those engineering designs done quicker. Well if a farmer made up his own design could he just submit it to you and you guys look at it? Um, we could explore that option. I'm not going to say no off the bat, but um, it's not something that we've done before. Usually we have the engineer from NRCS do the design because it has to meet our standards and specifications. So that is usually the preferred route. How long does that process take? The engineering design? Yeah. Um, it depends on their workload and um, the farm. So it can be from three 
to six months or sometimes even more. I'm just being honest. 18 months? It could, mm -hmm. yes. Our okay, workload our workload is um, it's big. No, we're no. we're understaffed, so yeah. we're trying to do the best that we can, but yes, it's not something that you're gonna get, you know, in a week or in a month. The thing is it's not rocket science. No, it's not. And a lot of people in this room could probably do the design, and then if you could approve it, you know, or review it, it could speed up the whole process for everybody. But I mean, everything that's going to here today, we're going to take it back, and it's just ideas. So I, I, I'm not going to reject any ideas. We're just open you know, to hearing what your concerns are and seeing how we can best address them. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know of other funding sources that like work? like NRCS on this issue of climate resilience and have funds available for implementing these things because I know that um, it's such a great program and a really strong program, but there's like more need, you know. So I just wonder if anyone has already heard of that, maybe independent funders or, um, yeah, grants. Yeah. Yeah. Nova Mass has a program, a uh, climate, climate smart commodity program also. It's, it's similar to the NRCS program, but it's, it's not quite as limited by um, voice. So. Well, it, it, is, it is NRCS practices, but I think the funding rates may be different and a little more flexible. I can talk about that if you don't mind. Uh, I put some of these flyers up at the front there on the desk. Uh, my name is Stephen. I work at CISA. We're a partner on that same project that NOFA Mass is a partner on. On the sheet here, uh, you'll see through this, it's called a Climate Smart Commodities Project. It's separate from the RCS. It's separate from the IRA. There's 140 of these projects around the country, and there's a bunch that cover Massachusetts. And one of them is this program. And through this program, and through CISA, NOFA Mass, and one other partner in Massachusetts, there are 28 specific practices that are on the back of this. You can take a look. And a lot of them are the climate smart practices. That's why it's called climate smart farming. That's the whole idea. But this program, we can uh, cover 100% of the costs. Okay, so it's a little bit different. We have a different kind of budget. And supposedly one of the advantages is that the turnaround time will be faster. Uh, so that could possibly be an incentive for you as well. You also do get a $1,500 signing incentive bonus because there's going to be a little bit of data that we're going to need from you about how these things are going for you. Um, and the other piece is that the payments are twice the regional average for the practices. So because this project it goes from South Carolina to Maine to figure out how much uh, we'd be paying for these practices, you know, it would be impossible to have calculations for every single place, and so it's a regional uh, average times two. Uh, so even the payments look like they're going to be pretty good wherever they are, you know, because they do vary a lot. We understand it's different on each farm. So take a look at this. Uh, you can enroll there. Uh, you fill out a quick form, then it gets shot back to me to or the Max, and we'll be in touch uh, about getting you started. So this is another source. Steve, what are examples of the practices covered? Uh, alley cropping, contour buffer strips, cover crop, conservation cover, fence, field border, filter strip, forest farming, grass waterway, hedgerows, herbaceous wind barriers, nutrient management, no-till, residue and tillage management, livestock pipeline, mulching, pasture and hay planting, Prescribed grazing, raised planting, reduced re residue and tillage management, riparian and herbaceous cover, silva pasture, strip cropping, tree shrub, shrub establishment, upland wildlife habitat, vegetative area, watering facility, and wind rate. How about deer fencing? It's like a poem. Pardon? <laughs> deer fencing, Steve? Um, right here, I don't know that what 382, if somebody from NRCS knows a little bit more about practice 382. NRCS that's doesn't cover deer fencing in Massachusetts. Pardon? NRCS doesn't cover deer fencing in Massachusetts. Okay. So those are the 20 practices, but there are, you can take a look up at the front here. Do the NRCS programs cover tile draining and shale? 
<coughs> it's been approved, yeah. They said no, so. But the practice has been approved. I don't know about the payments. I don't know if the practice has been adapted in Massachusetts. Yes. Because it can be approved at the national level, but if Massachusetts doesn't have it as a practice that we're going to cost you on, then we, we don't have it available. And I, I can't offer that information just because I don't know if it's a practice that is offered in Massachusetts. Are there folks in the room that are interested in Tile Branch? What? But it sounds like NRCS could expand and cover it in Massachusetts if there was a need. So, yeah. is there a need? Yeah. Raise your hand if you're interested in tile drainage. <laughs> You gotta give us some time to absorb all this stuff, you know, because it's it's it, it's an awful lot to absorb, you know. These uh, he's just right, right, right. right, and we don't know if we if, if we if we can use it. We don't know, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe we can. Maybe we can. I don't know. Maybe it's just a waste of money to implement something. And nowadays, the way things are with the budget situation, we don't want to waste money, period, in this subject. We just want to spend money wisely, and that's it. I think that's exactly where the state programs come in, is that they can take some of the risk <coughs> out of trying something that would be new. Yeah, but the state takes an awful long time. And we can't wait because we have insurance bills, we have electric bills, we have payments linked to banks, we have, and we can't wait six, eight, nine, ten months. We can't wait. We, we need cash right away. Why we're in this business is to get some money now for next year. We're already thinking next year, already. And you know, we're just, we, don't, we, we honestly don't know. We honestly don't know what programs are available, what programs are we can use or what. It's a guess, it's a tractor. I don't know. You know, maybe there's somebody here who's better off than I, I am. Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But, you know, we have to look at what we can. You know, we have to start small and increase. That's what we got to do. You know? And that's my say on it. Julie, could you define what you mean by climate mitigation and climate adaptation, just so everybody in the room knows? Well, generally, mitigation is used to talk about reducing um, uh, greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. And generally, climate adaptation is talking about adapting to changing, current changing conditions and projected future conditions. Um, and, you know, they're, of course, related, um, but I think that um, I just wanted to make sure because sometimes the language you use right when you apply for the NRCS programs is really important in using the language that NRCS needs to hear. Yep. And um, up front, I know that there's um, printouts of the, this great list of climate smart ag and farm and forest practices that are particularly covered by NRCS during this round of funding. So I think it's important just to make sure that the projects that people are interested in working on are the ones that are listed in their priorities. Hey, 
Joe, do you want to talk about what you talked about yesterday? Now, I'm coming off of last year. Coming off of last year, being as bloody good as it was. My, from my own perspective, it seems that, at least in this area, we have a lot of, a lot of the infrastructure to deal with the water that has come down is already there. It just has to be maintained. A lot of, if there's a way that the NRCS would help us to clean out every single drainage ditch and grass waterway from the source to the outlet. I think a lot of what happened last year, not all of it, but a lot of it, would have been less. We are running into situations where being in New England and in Massachusetts, there are ditches that have been around for hundreds of years. Now over those hundreds of years, things called houses have cropped up. So now, instead of ditches running straight through fields and into a river and brook, now they would, 100 years ago now, they go through a suburb or subdivision or uh, something else, I don't know what. But, and we can only clear up to where the, where, where our boundary line is. We need to be able to clear all the way down to the outlets so that the water <coughs> will flow. We're running into situations where there's a ditch up until our boundary line, and then there's two or three feet difference because it's been silted in. And we need to be able to clean it right out from the outlet. Some ditches you're going to have to clean six, six, seven, eight times a year. Some ditches you're going to have to clean once every 20 years. No, I don't think there's a There is no here. set schedule. There is no set schedule. It's all dependent on the ditch itself. Yeah. And we have to be able to go into somebody's house, in, irregardless of the municipality involved. We have to be able to go in and say, we we're going to clean that ditch out. We can't wait six, eight months. We can't. Right into that, I have, I have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, I understood that you have this in the land. Are those clean? Yes Are they no. We maintain them. We maintain them. Because yeah. on my own personal situation is, I have an outlet that goes, so I clean it from the outlet back up. So the situation that I'm talking about does not specifically pertain to me. It mainly pertains to other farmers in town, neighbors, that you can see very clearly that if you were able to clean all the way out the outlet, you wouldn't have ponds and fields. You'd be able to salvage some of the lost crops. <laughs> yeah. I'll just say a related issue. If the ditch has been there long enough and not been cleaned out long enough, it can be considered a wetland and you can't clean it out anymore. Well, we just have to stop that. We have to well, stop that. Because agriculture, you can't clean it. What? If it's the land is used for agriculture, you can't clean it. You can't it depends on, well, according to the last statement I got, it depends on if that was uh, on a map in 56 and what it was blue or not. It's 1985. <coughs> and the NRCS has, has the historic maps. <coughs> so what we did when I worked at CISA, we worked with the NRCS to get the maps and figure it out who you know, it was a, uh, an agricultural ditch then, and that if it is, it came up to be maintained. And a lot of we found out, at least from the heavy area, you know, if you maintain your piece, when the heavy rains come, it washed off downwards. 
right? Because that's the power of water. But if you don't maintain or you only clean, like applying herbicides, that doesn't help because the you know the leftover is going to be there and and will fall inside of the beach. And that doesn't help because it creates traction in the water. The water is going to be slower, and you will not wash the sediments, right? Mm -hmm. Even when you don't have an outlet, if the water has enough power, enough force going downwards, it can wash off the sediment. But if you are not clean, which, you know, martini, it's not only with the lawnmower and cutting the grass, it's, it's not a, a golf course, you know? A beach, you need to clean up the sides, you need to take that sediments out of there, you know? And the, before, at least in Hatfield, historically, because I, I know some of the, so the towns cleaned before, right? The towns were responsible for cleaning up the beaches, but their budget got cut. And then no one else was doing it. So what we need to figure it out together is who's gonna do next, right? Because it's not something that no one can do without permission. It has to be an agreement. We need to figure out all the Hong Kongs that we have to deal with and even need that. And it's not an easy process. Just to add another thing I was told, the potential impediment that that would be a, a, a boring, boring study to find out what the historical depth of the beach was to figure out what the beach was too. Just another obstacle that may or may not be good. So Carolyn, can farmers here who live in Hadley call up you or call up Scott or like who should they talk so to? I, I think for, it would be helpful to start with me because I can kind of just, if I can get keep certain contact people, I can get them to come and talk to me and then I can kind of get them to talk to me.
to get the support that they need and if you know have some of you access to it? No, but we've gotten we can't wait. We we right away. Right, gotcha. We need immediately. Yeah. So if if it's been our experience that if we call up NRCS, we call up the uh, department and everything, it takes months to get an answer. And generally, if you have a farmer calling you up, oh, they need an answer yesterday. They need it done yesterday. Yeah. They can't move. They're going out six, eight months. Will not work. Because Mother Nature has sped up our timeline to a nth degree. So government needs to catch up with the pace of Mother Nature. We have um, an active contract with NRCS at Start Day Farm. And we've been like, rolling through a few different programs. And we also have a they've been doing some work on cleaning out some of the ditches. Yeah. Are, they, are they running into any problems with easements or anything like that where one neighbor will say, sure, clean it out, and then the next person will yes. say, no way? Yeah, I think that's part of the problem also with that whole phone stuff in the ditch. And that, that's probably one of the biggest um, challenges that we have with Is there any way that NRCS can work with or educate the conservation commissions in terms of what you can and can't do? Because in reality, the conservation commissions that I've dealt with in three different towns can be a real impediment to try and do anything to drain, land, <coughs> develop the irrigation. What's uh, what can you do? You're speaking specifically of hi. So I'm Matt Harris. I grew up on a farm in Deerfield, and I work for the conservation district, the local one, Hampton, New Hampshire Conservation. Um, I also work with NRCS, uh, so I do some NRCS work. So I know a little bit about that, but I also work specifically with the district. 
and I'm on a board for Conservation Commission, which are like very different things. The conservation Commissions are solely focused on wetlands and streams, and their only jurisdiction is when, if I'm getting this correctly, 100 feet of a wetland or 200 feet within a stream. Anything beyond that, a uh, conservation commission has no jurisdiction. Right, but in terms of cleaning the ditch, if you're at the ditch, you're hitting 100 feet. Mm -hmm. Can you do that without going to the conservation commission? What town do you live in? I live in Sutherland. Sutherland? Yeah, and there might be some differences. I'm kind of new to the conservation commission. I've just been on for about a year at this point. It's all, all this stuff is like pretty complicated to make your head spin. Um, I know, my understanding is conservation commissions wouldn't work with agricultural ditches. I live up in Hatchfield, there's no agricultural ditches up there, so I can't say with certainty, um, so I could be wrong about that, and my apologies to I am. I think the mainly, our main consideration, in my understanding of conservation commissions in general, is like wetlands specifically, they're kind of like their sole priority of the wetland act. Um, but then within streams and rivers, so a ditch, I think, I, for our conservation commission, we would consider that outside of our, the scope of our work, an agricultural ditch. The problem is, who's going to define what a ditch is compared to an intermittent stream or yeah. <coughs> a lot of it? A lot of it's what's happening. It's actually we found the law. And, and if you don't mind, to give, you know, like put your email, there's a uh, spreadsheet. I can send you the video where someone will <laughs> state that one's profession states each law that you can't clean up your ditch.
there's no communication between, between conservation districts and conservation commissions. They don't talk to each other at all. Nope. Um, I got on the board of the conservation commission so I could figure out what the hell are these people doing and get a better understanding of what they're working with. And there's no relationship there. And so I feel like, you know, to be, I'm sometimes not within my area, within my county. I should make an attempt to actually connect those people to some communication. But also residents being a part of that conversation would be really important too. Can I just repeat what you said in the back and make sure I understood it correctly. If it's a ditch and it's been under agriculture, wetlands does not apply to it. The wetlands protection does not apply. Is that correct? Okay. I, I can cover the, the presentation by the expert because I'm not okay. so that. So that makes it possible for people to clean their own ditches out. Yes. It doesn't help them downstream where somebody has a house and a neighborhood and they don't want to do it. So it, se it seems like what has to happen there is, and it's not going to take six or eight months, but somebody has to jump in and take eminent domain and control the ditches and get them all clean. And that's like a long-term process, but it means getting legislatures and involved in, in making it happen. Yeah. That is not. What's that? New York. New York. So New York does that already, apparently, for the Mr. Scrotch. You actually have a legislative commission coming next week. Uh, so it's a little bit of the Mr.
several years. And they were out there with their kind of drama parents and everything else. And um, I've had a problem with perennial weeds. So I like to flip over the soil about every fourth year. I know that's kind of that's kind of soon, but for that reason, um, some of the lighter soils like on the honey pot area badly, I think you could go almost indefinitely with the zone building without compaction issues. On the West Street, it's different, it's heavier. I went four years without mold or plowing. The fifth year I plowed, and when I finished, if you looked at the field, it looked like a cemetery. It broke up such heavy pieces of compact soil they were leaning at slants like headstones in the field. So I you know I think that's a wonderful technology and we all all know the advantages, but given on the soil you I don't think you can do it that you know, causing more problems than you're trying to solve. Do you use subsoil? Uh, oh, but but the zone builder does it. I don't really need to use subsoil if I zone build, however, some fields that have low dips, angles, the water stands, both both. Uh, go one way with the sub conventional subsoiler, and the other way in row the zone builder, and it helps a lot. A lot. Wait, what's the? I've you, I've heard them used interchangeably. I thought they were the same. What's the difference well, between the subsoiler? Since the heat goes down a certain depth and cracks the hard pan, the zone builder is much more elaborate. The heat will crack the hard pan down there, and there are cultures that will make a raised hill over that split. Basketball is that condition it. You plant on that, so you never drive on it the whole season. And, and it will leach now. I mean, I've had little five and six inch corn plants fall off the ground. But that's not a problem. But I'm just saying, it's wonderful technology. Well worth it. Do you feel like that's helped with your, with the, the same thing with wet dry conditions? Yeah, well, absolutely. In a drought year, on uh, the adjacent field that was exactly the same soil, planted at the same time, both of us sweet corn. On the rising slope, mine produced very good ears. The other guys were all little nubbins and duds. In a wet year, I've watched adjacent fields melt with phytophthora with pools of water standing there. I bleached down in a short amount of time after the big rain fall. It's whatever you spend on that machine, um, and it, you know, you can get grants. Uh, it's worth it, it's worth it. I really think so. Yeah, that's been our experience too. We've done several years at the Hub Hub Mills, where we're kind of in between you two guys and scale. Um, it's helped a lot. And we had in the last few years super wet, and before that, super dry.
Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jamie uh, Newland. I'm the director of the Farm Service Agency in uh, Hadley and up in Greenfield, uh, three counties. Um, I work side by side with Sylvia. Um, FSA is a sister agency of NRCS, so we, we do a lot of work together. I just wanted to mention a few items um, uh, as far as safety net programs go. Um, right now, the dairy margin uh, coverage program is open until the end of April. Um, that program, you can, you can ensure a margin between the price of milk and the cost of feed all the way up to $9.50. Um, and most people do the full coverage. Um, um, it's $100 to sign up. There is already a payment trigger for January um, that goes a good way to paying the annual premium. So I'd say by after February, should a payment trigger, um, the premium would be paid off at that point if you elect to pay the premium off instead of paying at the end of the year. Um, last week on Friday, uh, the uh, non-insured crop assistance program sign up deadline passed. Mm -hmm. um, but we can, um, if you are a beginning farmer or if you belong to a historically underserved group, uh, it's really easy to get you signed up late. Um, those groups of people um, get, get free basic coverage. It's a really good deal. Um, and a 50% um, uh, rebate on, on premium prices for, for buy-up coverage. Um, if you don't belong to one of those groups and you're interested, um, there's a good chance we could still get you in uh, by a late sign-up. Um, there's a few tricks of the trade to, to get the county committee to, to accept your late application. So if that's something you're interested in, um, give me a call. Um, additionally, right now, uh, there is a program, the Emergency uh, uh, Relief Program for 2022. Um, it's meant to uh, reward people that have insurance coverage. Um, it's kind of a top-off payment for people that had losses. Um, for people that didn't have insurance in 22, there still is a way to get a payment, although it's, it's, a, it's a rougher road. You'd probably need to employ um, a CPA, or maybe you're really good at taxes, I don't know. Um, but basically, what you would have to do is show that compared to 20 or 21, um, your uh, revenue was much higher than 22. And if there's a big enough difference, then you would be uh, reimbursed a certain percentage of, of that shortfall. Um, in any case, um, we're, uh, I'm brand new down in the Headley office. Um, we're trying to uh, get stuff ready for this coming year. Um, I would say, there, you know, we had a lot of trouble uh, with staff last year, partly due to um, due to climate change. I mean, we we need to adapt, um, uh, and you know, when you have a small staff and something that big happens, it puts an enormous amount of pressure on you guys, but also on us trying to help you. And um, and I'm committed to to um, finishing the job from last year. There's some on stuff stuff left undone that we're working hard on. So um, I can't wait to see you in the office. So give me a call. Thank you. And also, uh, my name is Tom Carrington. I'm also with the FSA. I work at the state office, helping Jamie out whenever he needs. But to talk about uh, Stephen with the Climate Smart Commodities Program, if you are interested in that, we are the records keeper. If you already have a farming track, you can reach out to the USDA Service Centers and they can they can give you the information that you would require to sign up for that program. That includes a farm export, so if you have a farm and track number, uh, as well as a subsidiary print, and you can use those documents to sign up for that climate smart uh, commodities program. I'm also the manager for ECP, so unfortunately not looking forward to avoid uh, any potential effects of climate change, but looking backwards. So we've had drought and we've had flood in the past, um, but we have programs that helps uh, in those times. So for the drought, we're working with producers to install livestock wells. Uh, for flooding, it's debris cleanup, uh, re-leveling fields that have gotten gullies washed out, uh, repairing roads uh, so you can have access to your fields. And that is working on a cost share basis. So when those disaster events uh, happen, I definitely encourage you to reach out to your service centers to see what's available so that you could get on those signups for those programs. And they have, but because they are uh, restricted to responding to those flood events. 
or those disaster events. So going forward, if, you, if you're experiencing a disaster event and you feel like um, that should be something that we should be working on, definitely contact us so we're aware of it so that we can process those requests up, uh, to the national office and then get some funding for you to install um, some practices that help mitigate uh, the losses from the disaster events. Um, I was also asked to mention a little bit about the ditches. So in order to be uh, compliant or eligible for USDA, you are able to maintain um, and clean any ditches that are existing since 85 or have been inspected by NRCS in, in the past. Uh, when we talk about concerns, it would be if you're expanding the capacity for the ditch, if you're going deeper. So that if you're within the historic uh, footprint of that ditch, you're completely compliant. Uh, if you have any questions, we definitely also urge you to reach out to the local NRCS office or FSA and ask, you know, what is maintenance, what is cleaning, and then we can try to help you answer those questions. What about under a road? What's up? What about under a road? Under a road, if it's existed, uh, you know, prior to it, December, it, it's been existing for years. Then it's then it should be good to go. Uh, you should be able to clean that area. Um, and, uh, as long as it's not expanding in any way, then you're good. Uh, it's, it will be still eligible for at USDA benefits. But again, if you have any questions, Jamie would be your person for Hadley, Hampshire, Greenfield, but we have seven service centers across the state. Um, so depending on what your county is, uh, there is a service center there for you. Um, but if you have any other questions about emergency programs, uh, farm records for, because if you have an NRCS contract, you will also come to us for a brief time to establish a farm. We'll draw out your farm, so then they can sign you up for programs and uh, with, with that way too. So um, I can answer any questions as well. Yeah, do you want to speak? Uh, I'm Dan Sprost, the uh, Director of Soil Farm Service Agency. And, you know, reporting disasters to us is very crucial and important. Over the last several years, we've had so many different weather events crops that have uh, you know, damage crops. I mean, last year was just terrible. Um, but we see there's more of a trend than there every year. So if you have a lot, please report, report it to your local office. Um, if you're not into that program, okay. But what that does is it triggers, what I've tried to do and I've instilled in my staff is to make sure that we're getting these numbers down. Like last year, um, I was working with Senator Warren's office, Senator Merkin's office, Congressman McGovern's office, and all that to, to get this disaster declaration declared. And the, the, the reason why I'm saying that, you know, the, the big thing was, oh, you know, people, you know, we, we, have, we have a loan program. Yes, we do have a loan program for an emergency type situation, but the, the, the big talk was we don't want more. That, but that's there. But, but like with the case of what Jamie talked about with the ERP program, that is based upon a disaster declaration. Okay, so the reason why we got the ERP twenty twenty two, I shot on the cap, but it's ERP twenty twenty two was a result of the fact that we put in for disaster declaration for the drought previously. Okay. So it's very important to stay in contact with your FSA office so that we can, you know, push that down. You know, we had that early frost. Remember we had that early frost in, in February? Well, we had one back in, what, 2020 or 19, something like that, where it wiped out the peaches as well. So, and then we had another frost damage, you know, in early May that you know we put in for disaster declaration for that and then we also put in a disaster declaration for the flooding event that occurred on July 9th, July 9th, whatever it is. And then we're looking at it going, okay, who, who didn't turn the faucet off? Because it just kept raining. And I was telling my staff, I said, look, we're gonna when it stops raining, we're gonna put in for another one because some of those disasters were just localized to certain counties within the state. But as we all know, it didn't stop raining. So, Jane, uh, uh, Tom, when did we end up stopping on October 31st? Yes, yeah, so for the entire growing season, there's a disaster for excessive moisture and flooding, and that expands, so you are eligible 
for emergency loans, I think up until now, like, they're still available. If you have any damage that you need a loan for um, in response to those, those the growing season moisture, uh, that is something that's available. Yeah, and, and it's also continuous to, and that opened up, the work that we did here in Massachusetts also opened up programs up in New Hampshire, Connecticut, New York, but also they have issues too with weather events where we're continuous to them, so if they got something later, then if you wanted to have, get a, if you needed an emergency type loan, it's extended out. That was my, per, my, my thinking was, okay, we're gonna wait as long as we possibly can, because we have these, these current disasters that are in play right now, but if we can extend that, you know, so there was something on the news a few weeks ago that said the governor had put in a request to FEMA and to get some extra funding, but it was denied and she was going to have to resubmit. I don't know if this impacts that any of it. be with, with us, but we, I know that I've been working with uh, Senator Markey and Senator Warren's office and Congressman McGovern. Um, you know, we put forth, I forgot what the number was, but it was a big number. And... Uh, Hopefully, there'll be some, you know, something out of the budget to go like that used to go. We just passed the other budget that was yesterday, so I think the number they stumbled on is over $10 million of crop loss from the flood, and that was yeah. just the July flood, and not even I think talking about put excessive in, moisture. Yeah. Might even put it yeah. So I'm wondering if any of the experts here in the room know the answer to this question, because it's come up a number of times. So some people say that there's not, that folks who control the dams on the river aren't really talking to each other, and that's one of the reasons that there are some problems on Aqua Vita Road, other places. Do you have any ideas? Is there some sort of agreement at the state level where all the dams work together to try to control we're not, the flow? We're not part of that. <laughs> so I just say quickly, I've been working with Wally and your brother, Joe, uh, because five of the dams along the Connecticut River are up for relicensing uh, right. this year. Has anybody heard about this? Yeah. And so Joe asked me to put together a petition. Right. This is a, there's a public comment period until April 22nd. And we can submit comments to the Federal Energy Regulation Commission. So uh, this isn't a CESA thing, but Joe asked me to come here today because this is the petition that uh, he and a bunch of other farmers are passing around. Basically, I'll just, so everybody can hear it at once if you don't mind, the petition asks the FERC, the Federal Ed Energy Regulatory Commission, to require updated water management plans throughout all five facilities for relicensing plans that both consider how release schedules may affect farmland and how release schedules during increased extreme weathers should be managed going forward. The relicensing period requires public comment. All public comment has to be uh, reviewed and incorporated, so to speak, we would hope, into the updated licenses. Require dam owners to inform the public, and especially farms, of modified release schedules so that farmers can prepare by harvesting vulnerable crops, removing equipment and livestock from harm's way, and informing their farm crops. Require First Light and Great River Hydro to create a fund to reimburse farmers for a percentage of farm business revenue lost due to flooding. <coughs> and last, arrange for an in-person meeting between the FERC dam owners and managers and farmers concerned about the situation. This is what's called an intervention. This would be scaling up from just a public comment, which this is about. But there is an option within the commenting period where you can request what's called an intervention. That's what Joe and some other farmers he's working with are after. You need a certain amount of signatures to achieve that intervention? No, we don't. But if anybody wants to sign on to this, I'll pass these around. Uh, this is not getting involved in any political action of any kind. It's simply agreeing that the dams need to, the FERC should require the dams to follow these guidelines uh, that protect farmers and farmland. We uh, already signed before being so realized. We're, we're all set. Pardon? We already signed that petition. Did you you were at the at um we were at Nutrient. Blue Bonnet? Yes. Okay, yeah, there was a Blue Bonnet re um yeah. pesticide certificate event where Joe was. If you if you were there and you signed, you wouldn't want to sign this one. Okay. Uh, we already got your name, but I will pass this around. 
Yep. So and you know what? Yeah. The other thing is, I've been sitting here for the last 60 minutes listening to NRCS, FCS, F, so many anachronisms, it's mind boggling. And I've been listening to having programs done. You know, we're not asking for much. We're not asking for a fucking program. Excuse my English. Excuse my, I didn't, I apologize for that. But all we're, all, we're, all we're asking for is to get out of our way. That's it. That's it. We're not going to, we're not going to, all we're asking for is just sit down. Get out of our way. Stop these stupid programs that are, you know, the, myri the myriad of programs that are around. It's mind-boggling. I don't even know what, what they're, I don't even know what to follow. I don't even know where to go. I don't know what to do. And, you know, I've been farming my entire adult life. And I don't know what to do. So, you know, maybe it's time to take a step back, look at the, all the programs you got, maybe you're doubling up on, on, an, on another program that somebody else has got. Who knows? I don't know. But we need some action now. We don't need it in six months. We don't need it in eight months. We don't need it in 10 months. We need some action now. And, you know, I'm, I apologize. I'm sorry. I just, I'm just really upset that there are so many stupid programs around that it doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. I know about that. In terms of the five dams, is that really the problem? Or is it the flood control dams that empty into the ponds formed by the five dams? The five dams they have ponds, they have dams. The water comes up, it's going to flow from one to the other. It's the flood control dams that empty into the river that make the difference. So I don't see where your petition is really going because you're not really addressing the program. Well, first of all, I'm definitely not an expert in how dams are managed here. What I understand from Joe and some of the other farmers that I've talked to is their idea is that <coughs> The pre-event, meaning a big weather event, a big rain, release schedules could be modified so that the whatever is eventually released through the flood could happen beforehand or in smaller pulses coming out. And that would allow the dam itself to receive and hold the water that's coming in from the extreme event. I think you'd find that they're probably already doing that because it's yeah. in their best interest. Yeah. The thing is that the rainfall regime has changed and the management practices of the dams may not be keeping up with those changes. But yeah, well, we don't know that. Yeah, but that, that's, I think, where the question lies and what we would want to get from an intervention. The reassurance that everything is being done that can be done under these new extreme circumstances because all of the systems for release are based on you know, normal rainfall patterns, which we don't really have anymore. You know, that point, I mean, I've parted along the river all my life, ground zero. I can tell you now that the majority of our losses were man-made, not nature-made. But um, coordinating all the dams uh, would help when there's a release. But I would agree with you that the biggest impact is the flood control reservoir releases and what they're doing there, back when those were built with taxpayers' money, the only legitimate use of those was to keep them as empty as possible at all times, to take on water in an emergency, but they're using them differently, holding on to water for hydroelectric during a drought or recreation, whatever, so then when an event happens, now they're flushing the toilet, but then all the dams 
power dam, what a oil can, all these other dam, Vernon, whatever, they have to be coordinated to handle when something is released. Where you indicate you think they're doing that already. But I, I, I'm going to open this meeting. I'm helping to circulate this uh, petition. I hope you do get me. Because we have to talk to the, the five dams. We, we do need to talk to the people that have the flood control reservoirs. That's the biggest problem in the region. Does the Deerfield River contribute from the Longfield or not? Yeah, but I'll tell you, I, I thank heaven I live along the Connecticut River. The Deerfield River is a very dangerous river. Everything's downhill up above. And look at the flood, in, look at Hurricane Irene flood. Those people at Stillwater were almost drowned there where we had time to <coughs> Yeah, But the Deerfield goes into the Connecticut, so below the Deerfield does have an impact, you know? Every tributary does. But that Deerfield River, oh, oh that's a dangerous one. Yeah, Jim, you're going And you could put it in on a tunnel that you built 10 years ago? I just want to mention that um, NRCS also covers pest management as part of your plan. They haven't done a lot of it historically, but we've been working with planners across the state to work with farms to create these plans. And so if you have an NRCS planner and you, and you have a plan maybe looking at soil health or irrigation, talk to your planner about adding pest management because they can cover stuff like insect netting. They can even cover pesticides. If we recommend that you spray this instead of that, you can use the money to buy pesticides. Like, uh, and so not a lot of people know about it, so I'm just putting it out there. Hey, before this meeting comes to a close, 
Uh, I want to let you know that there were a lot of things talked about so far today. It's all been documented. Alex from Hadley Media has done it. And Alex, how would people access this video in the future if they want to listen in to part of it and hear something that was discussed? Yep, so you look up, go to YouTube, you look up Hadley Media. Um, I'm sorry, I'm talking about it. You, you go to YouTube, you uh, look up Hadley Media. Um, this will be up later tonight, hopefully, so um, you'll all be able to access it by tomorrow morning, because it does take a little bit of process. So um, by tomorrow morning, we'll be up. And, and Alex was in one of our climate change meetings, and he offered to come in and take this just so we would have a record of what people said for the future. We also want to make sure before you leave, drop off your cards. What are your concerns? What are your solutions? And I do want to mention we did film last, it was last week's um, MDR, MDAR event at North Valley Sugar Shack. They talked about APR land. So if you missed that, we have that up already on YouTube. Did you film the event at Barstow's a few weeks ago? No. Okay. MDAR isn't here, I don't think. I don't think I see anyone from MDAR, but they certainly also have lots of grant-based programs um, to cover all kinds of infrastructure. And is there, there's a climate-specific program. They have a thing about, well, nothing to do with the climate program. Stephen talked about, but they have a grant that's under a Climate Smart Ag program or something, and it incorporates all of their, like, energy I know it's not ideal to have money available that you have to apply for, and I know they hear that feedback a lot, but there is money out there. Yeah. Just um, jumping off of that, too, like, um, I went and had a meeting at CISA, and they have support for grant writing and understanding what, when, and when the deadlines are. And it actually really helped me to like get started because to try and figure out all this stuff on my own, it just was not going to happen. So um, that's another resource, just talking to someone at CISA. Is anyone thinking about getting crop insurance after last year who didn't already have it? I wanted to ask, does, everybody, does anybody know if there is mixed vegetable crop insurance? Okay. That is NAP's insurance took us 15 months yeah. to pay that yeah. from NAP's. It's useless. It's utterly useless. Well, <coughs> yeah, we, I mean, we're in charge of the NAP program, and yeah, we, there was just an overwhelming amount of uh, producers that had suffered losses, not only in the valley here, but across the state. So we are trying to get, I'm, constantly bugging Washington and trying to get a, uh, a jump team to come in for our state to help assist in uh, resolving some of those issues. We had a couple of uh, key people uh, leave and have the office. Mm -hmm. So that set us back a lot as well. I'm a farmer myself. I'm frustrated that you all are if you that in that program. So we're trying to rectify it and just have to Please bear with us and we'll try to get done as soon as we possibly can. But the NAP program is a good program. And there's a lot of good farmers in this room, and you want to look at, you want to protect your yield. A lot of people just, you know, see the, the catastrophic uh, coverage level because it's the cheapest one. But it may not necessarily pay the best for you. If you've got great yield, you want to protect those yields. So, the buyout program 
could be a, a good option for you. And when you speak with somebody like Jamie, he can show you what the difference is, what a payment would be. You know, if you're squash, say you had a 300 bushel um, yield on your squash. Well, if you, had, if you just bought the catastrophic coverage, what would it be with the buyout? And you might see that, you know, yeah, the premium's gonna cost you a little bit more, but in the long run, it might help you out. Well. And also, we're also always looking for loss adjusters, too. So if you're interested in ever becoming a loss adjuster for our agency, we all we can, um, we'd love to have you come on board as a loss adjuster. In, in cases like this, where we have so many different uh, you know, loss claims, that it's hard to get a, a loss adjuster out of So I would like to answer Ellen's question about the, is there an insurance program for mixed vegetables or mixed produce or mixed whatever? RMA does have programs that are revenue based. So whatever your farm revenue is, you're insuring that. So if your revenue after a bad year is much lower, they'll make up some of the difference. And so the there there can be a lot of paperwork but they're working on it and they adjust the programs every year based on our feedback you all's feedback um but they do exist and and so they're relevant for organic farms too a lot of times the complaint is that we're selling direct to market and so if you're giving us the national wholesale price like that's not gonna go very far in replacing our loss these programs, since they're based on the revenue, um, it's whatever you sold. Um, and if you're a really good farmer, your revenue is high, your payment is higher. So there's two levels. The whole farm revenue program is for farms, Lisa, up to three something million dollars. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and there's micro farm, which is $300,000 and less in revenue. Uh, I think it's like $17.5 million, the whole farm revenue. So it's a substantial amount, but not um, maybe for everyone, but for a lot of um, folks who maybe never considered having insurance before, I think those programs offer something slightly different than the programs that uh, FSA offers, which are really good for certain types of growers and crops. And if you need more information, I can send it to you. We did a webinar series on them that's on our YouTube channel if you want to check it out. I would, I would just like to say thank you to Wally for allowing us to allowing us here. And the cheers came from the Methodist Church. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to thank him for allowing us to be here. Wally, well, is there any help you need, like the chairs or stuff? No. Because it's going to rain so hard, we won't take it back till Monday. Hey, we'd like to uh, grab your cards. If you want to pass them this way, we'll walk down. We'll grab them. And eat some snacks. Yeah, have some snacks. Take some food on the way out of here. Okay. Or do you? Hey, Steven, I want to sign that. Thank you.